All right, it's a uh, real pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Mike Frank uh, to our second session of this semester's uh, Quantitative Life Sciences and CAMBAM uh, seminar series. Uh, Mike is an expert on child language development, and he combines both experimental and uh, modeling methods. And he's uh, right now a professor at Stanford, and we are really glad that he has accepted our invitation. So as usual, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, put them in the chat and um, I will ask, the, ask them to Mike if they're, if they're pressing questions and if not, we will have a time for discussion at the end. Over to you, Mike, all, all yours. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I uh, appreciate the invitation. And uh, so my, uh, is my sharing working? Yes, absolutely. Fabulous. Okay. Uh, so let me say at the outset that um, I, I appreciate this is a very interdisciplinary audience, and I'm, I'm very excited to be chatting with all of you about these topics, but I understand that the uh, knowledge base may vary, and so I really welcome questions for clarification or interest throughout the presentation. Um, as Suresh said, please feel free to put those in the chat. I'll be monitoring it, and he will be as well. Uh, I've also tried to keep this a little bit on the uh, shorter side, so uh, that will give us a little bit of extra time for discussion at the end. All right, so let me tell you a bit about my lab's attempts to bring larger data to bear on our studies of child language acquisition. Now, language learning is one of the key scientific puzzles for cognitive science. This transformation from speechless, wordless infants to children who can understand language and use language to make their way through the world is just an incredible thing to watch. Every typically developing child makes this transition. But understanding the process of learning is really a challenge. And a better understanding of this process is going to be important, not just for scientific theory, but also for clinical progress. And likely, it will enable the development of better speech technologies. So language explodes onto the scene. Here's my daughter, Madeline. She's 18 months old in this picture. The first thing she'd said was happy B which I think meant happy birthday. And then at 19 months, she combined words for the first time. And that made me a proud psycholinguist dad. She said blue ball, two different meanings put together to describe something in the world. By 23 months, her sentences are getting longer. She says, spike doggy, no food, eat dirt. And that's my mother-in-law, uh, my mother-in-law's dog, Spike. Uh, and he doesn't eat food, he mostly eats dirt. So this is a correct observation, albeit one that I never said. By 26 months, I, she's a teenager already. Uh, she's just a little bit, uh, a little bit bigger, a little, a little bit older. Um, she has uh, more dirt on her face, a couple pounds heavier. Uh, but she says, "Dada, move on, body. Might need a little bit more space." So she's not imitating me to learn these things, right? I, I didn't say this stuff. Uh, what she's doing is generalizing the input she hears uh, and expressing new meanings in constructive compositional ways. This is the challenge to be uh, explained, but uh, when you move to the literature to try to understand how well we can explain this process of language acquisition, I think what you find is somewhat disappointing. Uh, we are not good at either uh, explaining the processes or representations underlying uh, language development, nor predicting the variation in outcomes. Let me try to elaborate what I mean here. So when we look for explanatory models of language development in the literature, we find what I call ages and stages models. These are largely recapitulations of the data. Even when we go deeper into the experimental literature, our best theories still tend to look like a group of hypothesized distinct mechanisms linked uh, by individual experiments. Uh, there's not a lot of connections between these. We see that at a particular time period, you get uh, language specific vowel production. At another time, you might see uh, uh, recognition of language specific sound combinations and so forth. These are tied to individual experimental results, which are fascinating results, but there's not a theory that turns them into a mechanism that takes input from the environment and uh, results in learning. And it's also been challenging for our field to connect to uh, the broader kinds of outcomes that we care about, predicting variation in language acquisition. As a key illustration of this gap, you might be familiar with, in some form, the now classic study by Hart and Risley. Uh, this study has suggested that differences in children's vocabulary growth might be driven in part by their socioeconomic status. Uh, this study has launched hundreds of follow-up studies 
Uh, although not all have found the same striking effects, the same striking stratification by socioeconomic status, the general conclusion has been robust. And this study has inspired just a tremendous amount of work in policy and intervention. In fact, so much so that you might see bus ads saying, talk and sing to your child, remember to close the word gap. Uh, yet virtually none of this was grounded in theories about language acquisition. This is a lost opportunity for our field. Predicting and explaining this kind of variability between individuals should be a key goal for our work going forward. That's especially true because when you hear people talk about the theory they have in mind, it's more or less the same vague theory. That is, uh, children hear language input around them. Uh, some of this comes from their siblings and peers, others comes from parents. Some of it is child directed, as we call it. Uh, that means uh, referring to the child, talking to the child about the things around them. Uh, other aspects of it are, uh, are overheard. Um, which might have less evidential value for the child as a learning signal because it talks about things that are more abstract or harder to uh, see in the environment around them. The child then processes those, processes those in the moment, makes inferences about what that language input means, uh, and the uh, information accumulates, leading to the ability to produce and comprehend language, which uh, we take as learning outcomes. So both a broad goal for my lab and a a uh, tight goal of the particular project visualized here uh, is to formalize this theory and put it in contact with data. So we're uh, thinking about using statistical models to try to describe this process of accumulation and how it might lead to variability across individuals. Now, in fact, this is actually what I've been doing for more or less my entire career. Uh, this is a paper from my doctoral dissertation. I was interested in the process of mapping words to objects, so learning the labels, uh, say doggy, uh, for the stuffed dog and a short interaction between a child and a caregiver. And this was a, a statistical model that I made during my dissertation. Uh, the details don't really matter. It's really kind of just a learning model in this case. And the schema for the study is that we have input predictors. So I sat around and I annotated a few hours of video uh, other studies in this literature made up artificial data on which words co-occurred with which objects. All of this was very schematic, right? So they, the objects were uh, essentially the number one or the number two or the number four in some kind of uh, uh, discrete representation space. And the words similarly were the number seven and the number 46 uh, in that representation, different representation space. So we fed these input predictors uh, from the annotated corpus into the learning model. And we tried to predict a handful of binary experimental results. And what I mean by that is uh, we tried to, pre to uh, predict that uh, in a particular situation, the model would do the same thing that children did in a paper with P less than 0.05. So the key move we were making here was to think of the learning model as a scientific hypothesis about learning. And then we could contrast different learning models and try to make inferences about the principles of learning that were necessary to reproduce particular experimental results. And I, I still think that this strategy is a very good one. But looking at this schema, it's pretty clear that neither the input predictors nor the outcomes we had on hand were sufficient to evaluate scientific theories in particular depth. And indeed, as I moved on from this very first model and tried to do more model comparison, I realized I had run out of data. So I came to the con conclusion that we needed more data to build theories that can predict and explain. Now, of course, this is a very small conclusion from a, a very small set of uh, research projects. And uh, <laughs> these research projects are on very small people. But the general power of data has been uh, appreciated tremendously in, uh, the, in the field of AI and machine learning recently. As we found out in the past few years, artificial intelligence systems grow in leaps and bounds when the appropriate data are available. Uh, so um, the availability of large resources like web crawls for language models or ImageNet for computer vision models means that AI has just improved unbelievably in the past five, 10 years. Unfortunately, modern predictive models are incredibly data intensive much more so than our, our uh, little schematic scientific models. So each dot on the screen right now represents um, 500, uh, sorry, 50 million words of training. And so the full screen uh, represents 500 billion words that GPT-3, um, which you know, uh, now two years ago was a state-of-the-art language model, was trained on. Uh, and the red half dot is an average two-year-old's input. That's around 25 million words. 
the data disconnect here is striking. Uh, we've got 20,000 times less data for the two-year-old than for the language model. So in some sense, one, one way to describe my research program is whether we can evaluate learning models on children's actual learning inputs and outcomes. Uh, and if you think that way, you have to ask, what data might we use? And maybe what else would we learn along the way about children's development, about their environment, about their learning? And so that's the topic for this talk. So my lab, having recognized that there was this real data issue, data disconnect, a uh, problem for uh, comparing models, set out to build the resources that correspond to this viewpoint, this kind of standard model for language acquisition, uh, where we need to capture language input, language processing, and language learning. And we built a resource, or in some cases, several resources to capture each of these. So. Uh, we have um, corpora of children's language input, which I'll tell you about. Uh, corpora that document experimental results on children's language processing. And then uh, a, a database of their out learning outcomes. Pardon me. Uh, I also, uh, although it won't be the theme, I want to note that all of these projects that I'm going to tell you about are fundamentally open science projects. Uh, open science, I believe, is a key approach that enables faster research progress, especially when it comes to computation and data. So uh, in some of my work, I've been interested in uh, the replication issues in psychology, uh, trying to lead replication and sometimes computational reproducibility projects that probe the strength of the published literature. And I think that's a valuable way of understanding how our scientific processes evolve and how they lead to good outcomes. But uh, I think as we move in a culture shift, increasingly this culture shift is getting faster and uh, uh, things are, are really heating up with our new federal policies around data sharing, our new NIH policy in the US. Um, so so uh, there really is a culture change happening right now. And, and my take on this culture change is we can't just say, well, if we don't do open science, bad stuff happens. I mean, we, we can do that, but that's really fundamentally a, a stick, not a carrot. Uh, what we really, I think, should do is show people the exciting things that can happen when data are open, when code is open, when tools interface with one another, and we create an open scientific ecosystem that enables people to use all of the data in a particular field. Uh, and I, I think that that can be very exciting, and these projects are really my attempt to model what that kind of open ecosystem might look like, where we aggregate data from many labs and many research groups around the world and really try to bring together the field of child language and help it interface with this much broader world of AI and computation. And I, I hope that leads us to insights about the developing mind. So the, the talk is structured around the resources that we've built here and how they could be arranged into a predictive framework for fitting models about child language. Let me start just briefly by describing resources about children's input. So uh, I'll mention that, that the traditional ecosystem for studying child language has been transcripts of children and parents talking with one another. Uh, this is called the uh, CHILDS, the Child Language Data Exchange System. And we've built this tool, ChildsDB, uh, which is a database uh, front end for uh, Childless that allows uh, programmatic access and so forth. I, I won't tell you too much about this because really the details are, are most exciting for child language researchers. Uh, where I want to go, though, is to say, we don't just need transcripts, we actually need richer video data that show the full world of the child in the language acquisition situation. And for that, we've been really interested in using egocentric cameras like this one to try to describe children's experiences while they learn language. So towards that goal, we built a SACAM, which is a data set of egocentric video. So three children wore uh, these little portable cameras on their heads on a camping uh, headlamp uh, band that we adapted to hold this little camera with a fisheye lens. These are three children of developmental psychologists, so their families put up with this for two years, from six months uh, to around 30 months, so uh, uh, half a year to uh, two and a half years, and they wore the camera two hours a week on average. This strategy yielded more than 400 hours of video, along with annotations of context, some speech transcriptions, uh, and so you really get a rich data set that documents the lives of these children uh, and what's going on in their home. Just to give you a sense of what this looks like, here's a video. There's no sound on it. The sound is chaotic and kind of annoying, so I, I've turned it off here. 
Um, but looking at this video, you see some of the insights that have come out of this rich literature on using egocentric cameras with children. I, I'm not the originator of this method. Uh, folks like Linda Smith and Karen Adolph uh, and others have originated this, um, done really wonderful work with this method. And even in just a single video, you see that the child's visual world is very different than that of an adult. And so the context for language learning is really more like, wow, there's some really big objects around me that are kind of impinging on my field of view. Uh, hands come in and out. There are kind of pets on my level. Things are a little bit more chaotic, uh, moving a little bit faster. Uh, it has less of the static cinematic perspective that this kind of video has for adults uh, who tend to move their heads a little bit less and um, be a little bit less close to the objects they're working with. So th this is a fun data set. And uh, by putting it in uh, conversation with models in artificial intelligence, we've already uh, had some interesting successes. So um, just to give one example of how this kind of data can be used in AI, uh, Cheng Shu Shuang and Dan Yamans, uh, two uh, colleagues here at Stanford, have been developing unsupervised models for learning visual representations. And these kinds of unsupervised models have been very uh, influential in vision because uh, they're really a, a kind of an interesting way that you could learn representations from data uh, and that, that might uh, give you some insights on the structure of the visual system, the ventral visual system. Uh, so the particular models being uh, looked at here uh, learn what are called contrastive embeddings. These are representations that are optimized to maximize the similarity of related images while minimizing the similarity of distinct images. Uh, so. Um, the, these algorithms generally work to find embeddings that, that group together uh, uh, images and ideally objects then uh, in a, a particular high dimensional space. And in a recent paper, a group of us led by Chengshu used the SACAM data to train a variant of these algorithms that was optimized for video. So the video embeddings uh, use the temporal contiguity of frames to group together frames and the content of frames um, in this embedding space that are similar to one another. This paper is extremely rich. This is uh, really uh, Cheng Shu's work, not mine. Uh, but one of the many co cool results in this paper is that the representations that were learned by unsupervised methods, um, the video embeddings, um, and these are in red. So there's a couple of different video embedding uh, methods here. Um, these were quite closely related to neural activity in infratemporal cortex. Uh, for um, a, as the representations that were actually learned by supervised categorization models. So these two uh, lines here for local aggregation um, using SACAM and video instance embeddings using SACAM um, were pretty darn good considering the size of SACAM. Uh, local aggregation on ImageNet, um, which is a much larger data set, uh, beat them by a little bit, uh, and in fact also beat uh, uh, the supervised black bar for categorization here. Um, so the, the basic idea is that just with a, you know, from a machine learning standpoint, small, from a developmental perspective, large corpus, um, we uh, can actually get pretty good neural predictivity results uh, with um, unsupervised methods. So, of course, you'll say, look, you know, with ImageNet, the supervised baseline is still higher. And, and yeah, you said there's, you know, more data in that, but the proof is in the pudding. And that's exactly what uh, Chengshu said to us when uh, he got this result, he said, well, you know, I know it was probably a lot of work for you to make uh, SACAM. And it's like, yeah, yeah, it took a couple of years. So it was pretty significant. He said, but what about getting 10 times as much data? Uh, he said, okay, well, let's see about that. So um, this is uh, Bria Long, a fabulous postdoc uh, who um, is in my group. And um, Bria has been working on a new data set called the Baby View data set. Uh, so we went back to the drawing board, we re-engineered the uh, camera setup to get higher resolution, larger field of view. Um, this is actually a, a prototype camera. Uh, we have an even lighter weight, smaller uh, camera now uh, being deployed. And we are uh, deploying this uh, with a group of families aiming to get in aggregate a total of one child year of visual experience. And you'll see this uh, particular camera setup actually has a much wider field of view and a much especially a much uh, higher field of view. The, the visual angle is much larger and that gives you a much better sense of what the child might actually be aware of in their environment. So it looks a little bit less low res and choppy than the previous video. Let's try this orientation. This is the lead uh, designer who was actually designing the- uh, I know Zoe. I know it's not your favorite. The camera and, and putting it on her daughter Zoe for a Good thing for science, Bob. Yeah, that's pretty true. 
Okay. Hey, do you want to see this? What? What do you think about that? What are you wanting to see? Oh, I'm giving her a little calendar. So uh, one neat thing about this is you can see uh, Zoe's hands in the video, so you can really see her manipulating objects. Uh -huh. One of the amazing still, things about okay, uh, I don't want you to go run off with it, though, okay? About the uh, the field uh -huh. of view of a, a human is that you can actually see things that you're manipulating, which are quite far below you, uh, at the same time as you see the the faces of the people you're interacting with, which for a child are actually quite far above. So you can kind of move your head and move your eyes between those, and this new iteration of the camera captures those. I think quite nicely. So we're very excited about this uh, new baby view uh, data set that we're building. If you have a small child and want to participate, yeah, I would like to help collect data. Uh, please reach out to me. We're looking for pilot participants. So um, it'd be great to have uh, have participants from um, from this community. Okay, so so that's more or less what I wanted to share about uh, input uh, that we are measuring. So we're we're trying to capture what the child uh, learns and then. Uh, ideally use those to shape our hypotheses about learning mechanisms, but then we want to evaluate those hypotheses using outcome measures. Let me tell you about two of the outcome measures that we've been interested in. The first is a measure of processing, uh, known as looking while listening. Uh, so this is a measure that was developed by Anne Fernald and a variety of other folks. Uh, it's now become a quite standard measure in child language. The basic idea is very simple. Uh, you put two objects on a screen or pictures of two objects, a cookie and, and a book, and you say, look at the book. Where's the book? And the child's eyes move back and forth and then eventually usually settle on the referent of the sentence. So here are some representative data from this kind of work. This one's actually from a uh, study by a former student of mine, Kyle McDonald. Uh, he did this in collaboration with Anne Fernald, where um, he was actually testing kids and adults who were growing up as Native American Sign Language uh, users. So um, what you see is that the youngest children, uh, they uh, see the signs find ball, and then after ball, their eye movements start to go up towards the ball uh, to about maybe 60% recognition. The younger kids, their eye movements are going up even before the sign for ball is finished and their asymptote is higher. And for the adults, actually, they're starting to go up almost as soon as they see the beginnings of the ball sign. And by the time that the ball sign is completed, they're uh, at 80, 90% correct. And you see parallel results like this in studies with a wide variety of diverse populations, um, Spanish and English speakers, late talkers, premature kids, bilinguals, and so forth. So this pre presents an opportunity for us to aggregate the data across these different uses of a similar paradigm. And so taking advantage of that opportunity, we built a site called PeakBank. This is a flexible and reproducible interface to these developmental eye tracking data sets where we have time courses of eye movements across each trial for each child in each study. And we built a database schema that allows these all to be ingested into a common database format uh, this is actually quite a, an adventure. There's a data processing flow from a set of raw data sets through uh, specific import uh, scripts to a, uh, a validation and consolidation into this common eye tracking format um, in a relational database called the PeakBank database. And then this database can be accessed both through PeakBanker, which is a, an API that provides programmatic access, and through online visualizations. Now, this is actually uh, kind of an incredible amount of work. Uh, and so um, we went forward with this project through many, many hackathons, first in person and then remote. Uh, we're pleased to launch this, uh, this project officially uh, last year, and the paper was published this year. Just to give you a little bit of a sense of what you get out of this database, um, each of the panels in this plot is a different data set. We're now actually up to about 25 data sets from kids around the world. And what you see here is each colored line is a different word that's being tested in that data set with the black representing the average trajectory. So across different data sets, you see this characteristic rise with the zero point at the onset of the target word. Uh, and then sometimes a little bit of a fall off depending on how long the, the study period is. Some of these uh, data sets have a ton of different uh, words in them. This one had a lot. Others have just a small number and a lot of participants, so they have kind of fairly high fidelity trajectories 
Um, but this just gives you a sense of word recognition, language processing in action. So I, I could say a lot more about Peak Bank and the, this attempt to, to capture kids' recognition trajectory, but I, I wanna spend a little bit of time on uh, the last outcome measure, which is actually the one we've spent the most time with. Uh, that is uh, called the MacArthur Bates Communicative Development Inventory or the CDI. So the CDI is one of these forms that's used widely in child language research. Uh, it's actually kind of one of the gold standards for measuring very young children's vocabulary. And what it is is just a bubble sheet. It's just a checklist. Now there's an online form as well, uh, where parents go through and say whether their child says the word duck. Does the child say the word pig? Does their child say the word wolf? And what we mean by that is not just can they produce it, but do they actually say it with meaning? Uh, have you, can you remember an instance of that? Now, I. Uh, especially for those of you who maybe measure actual biological signals directly in, in some kind of model system, it may be surprising to you that we just ask parents about their children rather than measuring the children directly in some kind of uh, uh, you know, um, high fidelity way, even with eye tracking like I just showed you. But uh, the CDI forms actually uh, are a surprisingly reliable and valid measure of a child's overall language performance. So maybe just think about it for a second. Uh, if you want to measure a one and a half year old's language, you could bring them into the lab and do one of these eye tracking experiments. And if they're having a good day, you might get 10 or 15 minutes worth of data, allowing you to measure their knowledge of five or maybe 10 or 12 words, depending on how expert you are. But maybe they're having a bad day, maybe they're fussy and so forth. So you're going to have substantial data loss in this. And it's going to be very costly to bring all these kids into the lab. Or uh, you could use the real gold standard, which is you um, maybe you go to their house and you videotape a play session between them and their caregiver, and then you transcribe that laboriously. And then you count the words and the diversity of words they're using and normalize that for the amount of time. Uh, these methods can yield really rich pictures of kids' language, but they're very expensive and time consuming. In contrast, if you actually just ask parents about the language in a structured way, and there, these forms are quite long, so there's, there's a lot of detail, you get a holistic picture of the language that correlates very highly with those uh, other kinds of measures. And that, that means that the, the CDI is really useful because it's cheap and easy to administer. It, in fact, it can be used as a clinical screening measure. It can be used for measuring population and demographic variability and so forth. And because of that, there are actually more than 100 adaptations of the CDI to different languages and contexts around the world. Some of these adaptations are very, very widely used. And again, that creates a data opportunity. So back in 2015, we started aggregating the data from these uh, CDI forms on a site called WordBank. Uh, and we started with about 14 languages and really uh, began to build up this resource. Um, by 2019, uh, we had 29 languages. We we're getting up to 75,000 children. We actually just launched a revision of the site. Uh, so now we're at more than 40 languages, in fact. So uh, WordBank, again, following the similar schema, provides uh, a set of interactive visualizations and an application programming interface for navigating these data. Just to give you a sense of what you can do interactively with WordBank, uh, you can uh, kind of browse around uh, the, uh, the visualizations, for example, selecting a language. Um, maybe you're interested in German. And then perhaps uh, you might want to split the data up by some demographic variable. Uh, here's split by gender. Um, looking at the medians by gender, you can see a, a female advantage in the data. Uh, and you could quickly explore to confirm whether that female advantage is present in Korean, which it is or in other languages, um, maybe Swedish, which has a, a little bit less data, different data, again, female advantage. So uh, this kind of exploration can allow you to really uh, kind of plumb cross-linguistic variation, uh, demographic variation, variation in what words are known and so forth. So uh, this is actually a, our first open data project and we had a ton of fun with it. We really did a lot of exploration of this data set. Um, so much so that we published it recently in a book, uh, Variability and Consistency in Early Language Learning, the Word Bank Project. Uh, and if you're interested in this, this is a web book. It's, it's available free online, and uh, you're, you're welcome to browse it and um, take, take a look. Uh, we really tried to un understand the sources of cross-linguistic variation. 
just to whet your appetite and in case you're interested in learning more about child language i'll tell you three things that we learned from this uh exercise the first is that the language system is what we call tightly woven that is uh you know if you go to a linguistics department you'll see that there are people who study syntax and semantics and phonology and morphology and these different levels of description uh within individual children all of these different aspects of language hang together very tightly so if you're good at uh, communicating using gestures, you'll be, uh, you'll in a few months have a larger vocabulary. Uh, if you've got a larger vocabulary, you're probably better at putting the morphology, the word endings on words, and you probably combine words better, uh, and so forth. So all, all the aspects of language uh, hold together. Uh, also, across languages, children like to talk about the same kinds of things, which is sort of surprising. You might imagine that the, the things that children talk about in different cultures are very different from one another, but it's actually not really true. They talk about small objects, the people around them, uh, games and routines, uh, and so forth. So there, there, there's really a lot of commonality in vocabulary. And despite that, there is some variation between children, which is quantifiable. Uh, some children learn a little bit faster, others learn slower, and there is some difference in learning style that's uh, consistent and quantifiable across kids. Okay, so ho hopefully that whets your appetite. I won't say more about these descriptive results, but uh, this is one of the uh, bread and butter activities of my lab's work and be happy to, to share more. Okay, so, so now let me uh, end the talk uh, here um, by showing you a little bit about how we might put everything together into uh, a, um, at least a first model that allows us to test hypotheses about learning mechanisms. My inspiration here is a project that I participated in a number of years ago, um, known as the Human Speech Ohm Project. This is a project run out of MIT uh, by Deb Roy, uh, where he videotaped and uh, audio recorded his child's early life. Um, so this is a day in the life um, from the perspective of the ceiling mounted cameras in Deb's house. As you can see the lights come on in the morning, the day progresses, privacy shutters, people get ready, then the child plays, maybe nap time, everybody comes home, soon it's gonna be dinner time, then child gets put to bed, lights go off, and the day is over. So Deb recorded this unbelievable corpus, uh, uh, 36 months, 200 terabytes of data. And then Brandon Roy, the lead author of the study, actually then engaged in a laborious transcription effort to get the corpus of almost 9 million words of child available speech, uh, really trying to quantify the child's linguistic exposure. And what we did with this was try to create very simple predictive regression models when, of when particular words are learned. So uh, here's just a visualization. This is just a regression model where we plug in new uh, predictors to try to better guess when, uh, when the child says the word fish or ball or dog or truck. So uh, you, know, you start with just the frequency of the word and that gives you some predictive traction. Longer words are said later. Words in longer utterances are said later. And then we had a bunch of multimodal predictors that we were very interested in in this study, spatial, temporal, linguistic distinctiveness of words. And this allowed us to create a decent predictive model of when the child said particular things like fish, um, this is first word, uh, versus um, harder words like no, pencil, but, or has. So what we've tried to do now using the resources that I, I've told you about in the previous part of the talk is to extend this predictive word by word approach to larger data sets. And this is the work of Mika Braginski, uh, first a research assistant, now actually a postdoc that I work with. Um, so Mika has been very interested in, in the generalization of this, uh, this predictive model that was within child to a, a much broader ecosystem where we're actually predicting the average child's learning. So in this study, we extracted learning trajectories, the probability of a child knowing a particular word across 10 different languages. So this is age on the X and the proportion of children in word bank producing the word on the Y. And what you see is the word for dog and the word for jump. So uh, you see some cross-linguistic variation, but across uh, languages, uh, dog is usually uh, earlier than jump. So we can exploit this variation uh, and try to extract input predictors from corpora 
uh, in this case, the child language data exchange, feed those through a very simple learning model, in this case, just a regression model, and try to predict that uh, children's outcomes across languages. So there, there's a fairly complex pattern of results here. Uh, so th these are the coefficients on different regression uh, predictors, and each dot is a language. I will walk you through every single result here. Um, but there's some pattern of, of predictors across languages with some consistency. Uh, but I, I think really the, the consistency is actually the, uh, the interesting conclusion here in some sense. So if you correlate the predictors across languages and you compare those to a random baseline, you find that the correlation between predictors across languages is uh, really quite substantial. Um, so this first study told us that across 10 languages, actually the same information sources, the same predictors seem to matter for learners. Uh, and this was very exciting and, and kind of unexpected for us. We were thinking that the things that predicted a Turkish child's learning would be quite different than the things that predicted a Norwegian child's learning and so forth. And so in, in our follow-up work, we've largely been going in two directions. One is to try to really uh, put more languages in the mix here and get a larger data set that allows us to quantify uh, variation in predictors across uh, uh, different language families across the world. And then the second is to uh, increase the number of predictors here, really trying to add in some more model-based predictors. And, and that, that's a big focus of our effort, but I'll just show you one example of a study that, that does that, and that's where I'll end. Uh, so um, in this study, which is led by Abdella Fortasi, uh, we're interested in using lexical networks to predict uh, word learning. So a lexical network is when you take the words in the child's vocabulary and you connect them in a network structure. Uh, so here uh, I'm showing you an example where we're using uh, semantic structure to connect words. So daddy and mommy are connected here, but they're not connected to ball. And the edges in this graph are derived from word embeddings from word devec, which is a popular uh, uh, semantic structure model now kind of uh, quite a few years out of date. It's quite a few years old, um, but these, these embeddings are very simple to work with. They're very easy to understand. And actually for our purposes, the key thing was that we could uh, extract them from child-directed speech. So we could retrain these models on a fairly small sample of child-directed speech, get out a semantic space, and then use a threshold in that space to put edges on words, uh, between words, which gives us a network structure. And you can see how this uh, network structure grows as the child's vocabulary grows. Um, so initially you've got a set of unconnected islands, but then you see body parts and animals. And then as the child gets to be, you know, uh, one and a half, one and three quarters, you start to see these pretty elaborate islands of structure around animals, foods, body parts, and so forth, um, along with a kind of an interesting verb cluster over here. So uh, one hypothesis in the literature uh, that predates our work here, um, but, but it was very thought provoking to us, was the idea that these network structures actually allowed you to predict which words children would learn next. Uh, and so Abdella quantified these network structures across 10 different languages and then used them to try and predict learning. And uh, in fact, what he found was that the network geometry, uh, the meaning relations in the, these networks did predict age of acquisition over and above the baseline model that I just showed you. So he was able to get extra traction on the learning problem using uh, these sorts of models. And, and since Abdella's study, we've been using things like language models from natural language processing, um, some uh, kind of cross-linguistic data, uh, and so forth, uh, a variety of different data sets to try to increase the accuracy of these predictive models and get more traction on uh, what predicts the variation between words. Okay, so, so what I've argued today is that building theories of child language uh, and language acquisition requires better data resources. These resources in turn then help you interface with new unsupervised models and in artificial intelligence. Uh, and, and my hope is that this, this enterprise of creating resources and connecting them uh, in an open ecosystem uh, allows us uh, to create models of early language, but it can lead then to progress on both prediction and explanation of human learning. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Mike. Fascinating talk. So I have a whole bunch of questions, but first, yes, Alex, go ahead. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask Alex Diaz? 
I think it was clapping actually rather than a question. Oh, oh okay. Is there anyone else with a question? Oh, okay. Yeah. If not, I can start um, because yes, there's a question from Chen Yang, I think. Go ahead. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Thanks, uh, Mr. Frank, for a really good talk. I was wondering um, if you ever studied these kinds of models um, in terms of like bilingual children, for example, like in Montreal, a lot of children grow up speaking French and English. And me, myself, I grew up speaking English, Mandarin, and Taiwanese. Um, so does that add like complexity? Because when the children are growing up, language gets intermingled and then some words get confused for the word in another language. So like, how far your lab is in um, researching this area or is this like completely separate, more complex problem? Yeah, I have a, a backup slide just for this. So I didn't wanna add uh, kind of um, every single application of these predictive models um, but here's a, a really nice um, uh, honors thesis or a master's thesis by uh, Alvin Tan, an incoming PhD student uh, in my lab, uh, where he analyzed three different um, English Spanish data sets, which now are part of this new upgrade of Word Bank. And uh, so bilingual acquisition is, is uh, fascinating, right? Because uh, it's actually maybe by many counts, the default mode of language acquisition across the world, right? It's, it's actually kind of unusual to be monolingual in some ways. Um, and uh, we've been trying to use this this uh, framework we've been building about accumulation of language um, and the ability to use predictive models to, to kind of uh, predict differences between words based on this accumulation. Uh, and in a bilingual context, uh, individual kids have different aspects uh, of the language that, that are kind of um, accumulating faster, right? So more exposure uh, and different exposure to different languages. Uh, and so um, we've been interested in then predicting um, based on, say, how much English or how much Spanish a child learns, how fast their language will grow. Um, so again, we're kind of predicting their uh, probability of production, uh, and we can break down uh, sort of um, you know what their uh, um, what, you know what their growth is going to be in terms of English versus Spanish um, based on their exposure, whether they're kind of Spanish dominant or English dominant, uh, and so forth. So if they're you know if they're dominant in uh, in Spanish, their English is going to grow a little bit slower um, and be modulated by frequency. Uh, if they're uh, English dominant, their English is going to grow faster. And same thing for Spanish here. Uh, one cool thing that we were able to quantify in this study is actually the um, overlap and translation between languages. So if you have some uh, some translation equivalents in your vocabulary, if you know how to say dog, uh, does that actually help you learn the word dog in, uh, in Spanish or in French or whatever your second language is? Um, and uh, we actually find, oops, sorry, um, we find that it, it does. Um, so uh, there is a, a, uh, an extra effect of um, uh, translation equivalence, um, especially early on in development. So uh, having uh, a word in one of your languages actually helps boost the learning in the other language, um, but that's true, especially for younger children. Um, so there's a negative age interaction. So, so th this kind of framework helped us quantify the ways that uh, bilingual exposures is similar in the principles of learning and then kind of different in the outcomes. Great. We have a question from Anmar. Please. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, so it's just a follow up to the question that was asked earlier. I mean, um, um, do you see differences at least in the uh, in languages that are Indo-European versus, let's say, Semitic versus, um, you know, um, Southeast Asian, et cetera. Um, there, there could be some differences, especially with bilingual kids that uh, uh, you know, two different languages that uh, use different alphabets, et cetera, in terms of learning. So can you comment on this as well? Yes, so um, we are limited in, you know, uh, the languages that we can analyze because we don't just need our outcome measure, which is the children's learning. We also need corpora of the uh, input to the children. And in order to map between those, we also need an ecosystem of natural language processing tools for that language in order to parse and break down the 
uh, language and then uh, you know get the phonology and the morphology and the syntax and so forth. So um, there's this giant spreadsheet that my lab keeps of what are the resources for each language and which of these can we find so we can kind of add another green row uh, to the spreadsheet to add another language. And this has been very labor intensive. So, so um, we don't have all the languages that we want in, uh, in these comparisons. That said, one of the ways in which languages vary very, very saliently across the world is in how much morphology they have. Um, some languages have huge, huge amounts of morphology, so that means words are very inflected um, and they, uh, their meaning is changed by the, the endings and sub prefixes and suffixes, so beginnings and endings of the words, um, and they have to agree across different words and so forth. Um, Turkish is an example of this, Russian, um, for a variety of different languages. Others like English or Mandarin have very little morphology or no morphology essentially. Um, and really the meaning is carried by the combination of words in the sentence. Uh, and so we can use these, these models to try to look at that variation here. Um, so uh, here's my, my backup slide on that. This is the preliminary results from uh, a, a study of uh, cross-linguistic morphology where we used- uh, Sorry, can you explain what you mean by morphology? Sorry, I didn't, I'm not sure to understand what you mean by that. Oh, oh, sure, yeah, 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 great. Uh, sorry, this is a technical term from uh, linguistics. So um, morphology is the, uh, the beginnings and endings on words. Like in English, if we want to uh, say that there's more than one um, uh, squirrel, we might say squirrels. So we put that s on the end and that means plural. And uh, you know, if we, we want to say I was walking yesterday, I walked that little t on the end tells us it was in the past. But that's kind of most of what we've got in English. Um, in contrast, it, you know, in, in Spanish, if I say uh, la pelota, uh, I have to use a feminine article. So the, the article has to agree. I see, uh, I see, I see. And I in, in Turkish, I might have to say, you know, um, you know uh, for a verb, like, uh, did I see this thing happen? I have to say, you know, did, uh, was there, ever, how do I know about this action and so forth? So that some languages have lots and lots of uh, these endings on words. Maybe they have to agree with the subject and the object and so forth. Um, whereas in, in English, we don't have uh, as much of this. And in Mandarin, you have almost none. I see. Uh, so so um, the slide I'm showing here is, is an attempt to uh, categorize whether these things actually uh, play a large role in predicting acquisition. and and you know, this is a complex graph, but basically, you know, the pink is our baseline model where we see sort of significant predictors across languages. And then uh, here uh, are the, all of these other predictors from the morphology, um, verb frames, uh, categories, affixes. That's kind of how much of this morphology is there in your language. And we really don't see very much predictive traction. And especially Turkish, which is maybe the most morphological of these languages, we don't see very much of an effect. Um, so we're not actually seeing that 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 uh, kind of this this aspect of cross linguistic uh, variation makes a big difference. I see. I see. Okay, cool. thank you. We have questions from Georgie in the chat. Uh, maybe you can just read them. Um, so one question is about language disabilities, how you learning disabilities, and the other is about Arabic. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, okay, this may be a very broad question, but how would we be able to factor in learning disabilities, mainly ones that affect language learning, into the model? Uh, and and the flip side is it too early to give weight to learning disabilities? Not at all. A, a huge uh, goal for the CDI and for some of this work is to screen uh, children's early language more effectively so that they can be referred and uh, to a, a clinician, so a speech language pathologist for treatment if necessary. So finding kids that are late talkers, uh, that is they just have a, a language uh, disability um, disorder, uh, like my, my son has a kind of production issues and so he was quite a late talker. Um, or, uh, or they might have other, line, uh, other underlying developmental disorders. Um, for example, they might be on the autism spectrum, which uh, is related to some language impairments in some cases. Uh, so we have looked at these sorts of measures in um, autism spectrum disorders. In fact, we, we're really interested in the network geometry because some people had speculated that uh, semantic networks might be different in kids with autism. Uh, that's not the case in our uh, hands, at least. We, we see that their language grows similarly, albeit more slowly on average. Um, but there are some real differences in the particular words that are learned by kids on the spectrum, um, maybe related to their different interests. 
Um, cool. And then uh, the, the second question here was about plans to incorporate Arabic into the data set. Actually, um, we are working very actively with a group in uh, Saudi Arabia, Yinmo, um, which is interested in using CDIs for language screening uh, in Saudi Arabic. And we actually have um, some, some first results there. Um, so we're, we're, we've developed a new CDI instrument um, for Arabic and are hoping to get the language into WordBank quite soon. Great. It's a question from Jun Hung, also in the chat. It's very technical, so maybe uh, Michael, you should read it yourself. <laughs> sure. Would different syntactic typology or different dominant word orders lead to changes in the lexical network structure? A uh, great question. Uh, so, um, so th this is about the ways that languages vary in their syntax across the world's languages. So, there are some languages, for example, English, that puts the verb in the middle, subject, verb, object. We might contrast that with a language like. Uh, Japanese, which goes um, subject, object, verb at the end. Um, and then, of course, there are other languages in the world languages that put the verb at the beginning and so forth. There's different frequencies of these. Um, so uh, to a first approximation, our finding is that um, we do not see big syntactic and semantic differences across languages in the um, uh, the kinds of predictors that, that, that we find. Um, we are, we've started to use, um, for example, uh, language models from natural language processing to look at the predictability of words. And predictability does seem to uh, play a role in acquisition, especially for words like verbs um, or connecting words like uh, the and of and and, these sorts of words. Um, the, the extent that those are more predictable within the language, um, they're learned earlier and less predictable they're learned later. And so that's a syntactic effect. That's about the structure of the sentence. Um, but I, I think my generalization from a lot of this work is that um, languages differ from one another in a lot of ways, but they are the, the, way, the ways that we see that those different languages being learned is quite similar. The mechanisms operate over different kinds of input and get different outcomes, but, but uh, they, they're largely the same mechanisms. And, so, and actually, so the trajectories of learning and so forth are not that different. Cool. Um, I actually had a bunch of questions. Maybe I'll sneak one or two in, but if others have any, they can always ask. I'll just carry on. on I'll just take off from the question that was just asked and uh, ask about grammar. So you brought in grammar in addition to vocabulary here, right? So what does it tell us about learning of grammar? Is it is there an innate grammar? Is the grammar guided by the inputs they are receiving, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, great. Um, so uh, there, there's a limit to how much we can say about grammar using the CDI. Um, we can measure a bit about the complexity of the syntax um, in, uh, in children's language, but uh, it's limited because the, the observers are the parents and they're not acute observers of syntactic complexity. We say things like, uh, is the, does the child say things that are more like, um, want doll or I want the doll? And they can say, I want the doll. Like that's a more complex type of speech, but then it's kind of limited. Um, but from so, the recordings? Yeah, so, so the recordings can, uh, um, uh, can give us a little bit of a window provided that they're transcribed. I see. Um, and so forth, and that's that. That so we're not the best resource for that. The child <laughs> language data exchange system, the child, this, the, these transcripts. That's been the traditional uh, place where folks have looked to do analyses of the syntax of children's spoken language, their pr production in language. Got now it. that might not reflect their underlying competence. They they might know how to parse, for example, a sentence that they could not pr themselves produce. So yeah. uh, a combination of experimental results probing their comprehension uh, and uh, uh, sort of careful analysis of their production has, has been the critical um, tool for, for, for understanding this. Um, to that, I guess I would just add that, that you know, the recent breakthroughs in learning structure and language, including grammatical structure from raw data have been tremendous. Um, so AI models are not humans, they don't learn like humans, um, but they are a proof of concept that with a certain amount of data, uh, you can get generalizations that were not thought to be possible. And so there's some really wonderful work from Sam Bowman's group looking at, say, if you train a language model on not 500 billion words, but maybe 20 million words, like a child, what kinds of things can it do and can't it do? 
these baby birdas and uh, those are called the mini birdas. And then there's another group that has the baby birdas and these sorts of uh, proof of concepts with small amounts of data, I find very interesting. And, and uh, they, for me, do shed some light on longstanding questions about innateness of syntactic structure. At least they suggest, that they are, you know, uh, these things are in principle learnable from data. Yeah, that also answers another of my questions, actually. That's great. We have a question from Linda Polka in the chat. Uh, um, Linda is asking if there's an interest or plan to add other uh, developmental milestones. For example, are late walkers also late talkers? Hi, Linda. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate the question. So um, we are really limited in Word Bank by what uh, the contributors have already collected. And in the case of WordBank, a lot of these data sets don't come with a lot of metadata about the kids. So we don't have um, milestones for, uh, for walking and so forth, uh, not, at least not in any consistent way for most of the data sets. We do have some other data sets where we've been interested in assessing these relationships. You know, the, the walking, talking um, uh, relationship is, is an interesting one. Uh, you might imagine that in a population sample, there would be a relationship because there are some uh, developmental motor uh, disabilities that would lead to that relationship. Um, if you censor the data to have only uh, typically developing kids, um, my sense is that that relationship is weaker. So uh, there's a kind of a bit of a discussion debate. This is for everybody else. I, I think you're, you're aware of this. Um, so there are a couple of papers that got a lot of people interested because they suggested that vocabulary increased soon after the onset of walking. A lot of people got, got really, you know, um, pretty, pretty excited about that kind of uh, finding. Um, there are other papers uh, more recently that haven't found that. Um, in a data set of milestones, um, not, not actual vocabulary data, but just re parent reports of walking, talking, and so forth, we didn't find really strong relationships between these. Um, so yeah, tricky. You know, the the um, in the walking talking papers that there was an implicit causal inference, maybe an explicit causal inference, but it wasn't tested using causal inference methods. And I think the large data set with a uh, um, good causal inference methods would probably be the next way to to look at this. And you know, uh, the question isn't settled for me because there were there were a couple of nice data sets in the earlier papers, so the non replications were surprising. So I, I'm not. I'm basically I'm not sure about this topic, and would love to <laughs> know more. It might, it might be more about mobility in general. Some kids are pretty mobile, even though they're not walking. <laughs> also, also true. Yeah. So, so that could reduce the amount of power you have to see it around just walking. Yeah, I had another question. Um, I was curious about. You said that the the relationship of the the, the relationships were tight around kids who are like doing one thing with language or doing another thing. Um, so I'm just curious whether you think that relationship kind of extends earlier in development and if we had better data sets, we could, would find that, you know, the babies who are babbling earlier, maybe the ones who are going to be starting, you know, getting on that trajectory early, you know. My impression is that, that uh, is, you know, those yeah, kind of early, I think early vocalization is quite predictive. You'd actually probably know better than me on this. I, I, uh. Um, but, but, you know, um, <laughs> and, and of three or whatever, my, so my father-in-law is actually a speech pathologist. It's funny. I, you know, um, when I met my wife, I was, you know, studying philosophy and literature. And so it's just a kind of funny coincidence that I've ended up in the same, um, general field as my father-in-law. Um, but for each of my kids, he's said, um, oh yeah, they, they, you know, this one's not babbling or they, you know, this one's babbling and okay. Um, this is what's going to happen, and it's generally been true. Um, yeah. my, my son but Jonah. If we uh, had better, bigger data sets, I think we would we'd know more about that predictive relationship early. Yeah, yeah. But but my guess is that it's true. I, I mean, the the correlations um, between gesture and comprehension, uh, um, vocabulary size and uh, um, grammatical complexity, vocabulary size and um, morphological complexity, and so forth. These are very very strong. Um, yeah. they, they really hold together like almost nothing else. It's like you're measuring the same construct. It's really, yeah. it's quite remarkable. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Great. Um, yeah, so I think we're closing, getting to the end of the session. So maybe Alex, if you would like to stop the recording, you can. If you want to leave, you can. But maybe Mike, if you would like to stick around for a few, couple more minutes.